Welcome to APIS Weekly Webinar Series. My name is Billy Zadig, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to the web page later this afternoon. You will receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to the web page where all webinar recordings are housed, as well as a link to our upcoming webinars. We have webinars planned out through April 2020 and are now open for registration. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by the presenter. Professional continuing education credits are being offered. Please send me an email at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at appa.org to request a certificate if you did not indicate you wanted one when you registered. Also, if you have more than one person attending this session from a central location, please contact me so everyone gets credit for attending. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Chris Kopak, who will be your moderator for today's webinar. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Billy. We appreciate IAPA very much continuing giving back to our members on a routine basis through these webinars. As we've said before, they've been very successful. Uh, today, we got the pleasure of having Keith Schneeringer. Uh, he is the WAXI Director of Channel Marketing and Sustainability. He's been in the business of sustainability since 1990, lead certified, many certificates and certifications, uh, and he's with WAXI. And everybody knows WAXI has been a strong, strong supporter of our APA facilities leadership group throughout the country, and we appreciate that very much. And on a side note, we had an opportunity recently to work with uh, Keith and Waxy and a number of business partners, Diet Coke also, Coca-Cola. Uh, and we also have Jill Burris here at the University of Arizona. Jill Burris is our uh, project manager in charge of our sustainable efforts in terms of waste diversion. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We had a zero waste football game, very successful, and it would not have been successful if we didn't have the partnership of Waxy and Keith and others. So Keith, with that said, let's hear about zero waste. How do we uh, increase our diversion, increase our recycling efforts, and drive our campus towards zero waste? Take it away. Wonderful, thank, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you very much to everybody for your attendance here. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, let's jump right in here uh, as we look at what, our, what we're hoping to accomplish over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes uh, is to make sure that you leave here with a good definition of waste diversion, zero waste, and, and uh, we'll talk about overview of some, some waste diversion legislation that's out there that might be impacting some of us. Uh, we wanna talk about what does, what does waste look like on a, on a typical college campus? and then some suggested strategies to increase uh, diversion result and engage the custodial crew. So uh, uh, as we get started, what I'd like to be able to do is just share, just real briefly, for those of you who, who might not be familiar with Waxy, and, and you're, you're seeing like, hey, who, who, some guy from Waxy is, is giving a talk. What, what is a Waxy? Uh, Waxy is the name of, of our company. Uh, it's it's a family-owned company. We focus on janitorial and um, facility maintenance supplies. The last name of the owners is Wax, and uh, the the two brothers who started it in in uh, 1945, right after World War II. One of the brothers' nicknames was Waxy, so that's where Waxy Sanitary uh, Supply comes from. Uh, uh, we are looking forward to celebrating our 75th year of service in uh, next year in, in 2020, and uh, we've got locations throughout the Western United States. And uh, we also partner up with other distributors like ourselves uh, to help people in other parts of the country. So that's a little bit about Waxy. Um, when we talk about sustainability, Sustainability has been a part of the Waxy culture from the very beginning. Um, however, when the company first started back then in, in, in the mid 40s, uh, it was not really called sustainability. It was called just staying in business and keeping, you know, being really mindful of, with your resources and, and doing good things with your resources, doing more with less. The company has been instrumental in converting uh, uh, 
clients from folded towels to, to more source reduced roll towels and um, has also been instrumental in converting vacuum cleaners uh, from you know, uh, no filter, filters to vacuum cleaners with filters uh, to help with um, uh, you know, occupant wellness. Uh, in addition, the uh, company's been a pioneer in safer chemistry and dilution control, going from ready-to-use chemicals and, and glug-glugging uh, chemicals to closed-loop uh, safer systems. And all of these changes are brought about because we try and keep our ear to the ground and listen to customers. So uh, this presentation that, that we're going to be given here is, is a result of partnering with, with uh, many colleges and universities across the West, including University of Arizona, um, other uh, colleges that we'll talk about as, as we go through the presentation, but also uh, other large corporate campuses, uh, healthcare, all these sorts of things, all these uh, types of customers. So, so uh, uh, all of this, everything that, that we, we do is, is, is trying to help customers reach their goals. And so, uh, so the, our, uh, most recent path uh, uh, talk about sustainability was was uh, started with some customers there in Arizona talking about lead, and um, and as a result of some of those conversations and them saying that this lead rating system is important to them, uh, we began to to look at our own operations and 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 try and educate ourselves. For for those of us on the webinar who are not familiar with lead, lead is is an acronym for leadership in energy and environmental design. It's a it's a, um, a rating system for buildings, and one of the best ways that I heard it described is um, uh, it's like the green facts on the side of a building, uh, similar to like if you went, went to the store, bought a box of cookies, and, and it's got the nutritional facts on the side, uh, you know, carbohydrates and calories, et cetera. Think of a LEED certified building as having the LEED facts on the, you know, meta, you know sort of figuratively on the side, but instead of measuring calories, you're measuring energy efficiency, you're, you're measuring um, uh, water efficiency, and for the purposes of our conversation, you're, you're measuring materials and resource management. Um, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, it, it's, it's something that uh, uh, we know is, has been important to our customers, and that's why we've invested in our, in our education. And we have several people who are lead AP uh, O&Ms and uh, we've been active members of U.S. Green Building Council, and so a lot of the content that uh, that we uh, have here is is derived from uh, LEED and USGBC. Uh, and um, there are uh, a good number of credits that that could be pursued within the LEED rating system. Uh, I have up here the the uh, LEED 2009 uh, version uh, project scorecard, um, uh, but we also uh, you know can help customers out with, with lead version four projects uh, as people begin to, to transition to, to that platform. Uh, but one of, the, one of the certification systems that I wanted to make sure uh, that uh, people are aware of was uh, TRUE, which is uh, something that has evolved from uh, the uh, GBCI, the, the organization that, that oversees lead. They've got this rating system that's focused exclusively on waste diversion and so they offer uh, points for activities related to reducing reusing uh, re-earthing or composting and uh, and recycling and this is it's got some great resources uh, to help with organizing folks that that are are looking to uh, implement a waste diversion program or enhance the waste diversion program that they currently have. So true is, is something that I think is uh, um, uh, really a standard worth looking into further. And it's, and it's something that uh, when we worked with uh, Jill and, and Chris over there at University of Arizona, we, we lean very heavily on resources that are available through the, the true rating system. Um, and I think that this is a good place for us to, to um, start talking about definitions. And this is, so this will be one of the first places where we're going to talk about, so what does it mean for diversion? And so uh, up there on the screen here, we have a, a calculation so that people can say, okay, well, I'm, uh, I would like to divert 
you know, uh, waste from the landfill? How do I do calculations? So, so uh, uh, we're using this formula here, the diversion rate is equal to uh, the, the total materials diverted from the landfill, incineration, and the environment divided by the total waste generated. That gives you your waste diversion goal. Uh, and uh, so we work with clients who, who may be saying, hey, we're at, the, at the moment, we figure that we're diverting maybe 40 or 50 percent of, of, of the waste uh, from the landfill, but we have a goal of 60 percent, 70 percent, 80, maybe 90 percent. Uh, we'll talk about it in a bit here, uh, the definition of zero waste when we get there, but, but when we look at all these um, uh, opportunities that we have to divert waste from the landfill, it's not just uh, uh, focused on recycling. Uh, it's something where um, it, it's, it pays to think about how are the materials making their way onto the campus in the first place. And so if we can reduce the amount of materials that are, that are coming onto the campus, that's going to help us to, to decrease the amount that's, that's obviously then uh, uh, finding its way off the campus as, as waste. And then if we can figure out ways to reuse items that are making their way on campus, that's another way we can bring it down. Composting, we're going to talk about in, in a little bit more detail in a bit, but, but I think that this is a, a huge opportunity for most college campuses uh, in terms of looking at the food scraps and, and, and other organic matter that, that at the moment may be making its way into the landfill, but, but there's, there's huge opportunities there. And then, of course, there's recycling. Um, I know that uh, as uh, uh, we get ready to celebrate America Recycles Day tomorrow, uh, November 15th, um, we've written a series of articles over the years where we talk about uh, recycling and, and uh, um, I have a, a personal recollection of, of, of learning about recycling as, a, as an elementary school uh, kid growing up in the 70s, and, and so we've, we've got, uh, uh, we, we think about, you know, your, your, your cans and your bottles and, and, and these sorts of things, but, but as, as we think about this idea of, of uh, zero waste and, and, and increasing our diversion amount, uh, that uh, our diversion performance, we need to start thinking about things like food scraps and, 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 and other things that we've traditionally thought of as waste in the past. So when we, when we look at that uh, as the opportunity and, and we say, okay, let's, what can we do to create a roadmap? One of the things that, that we've done is, is we've worked with customers to create what we call the GPS screen partner support roadmap. And it's something that, that, uh, uh, We've been able to use this roadmap to help customers achieve LEED certification or ACE STARS certification. Uh, we, we haven't yet worked with anybody uh, on true certification, but we're definitely um, endeavoring to do that. But uh, uh, to, in order to look at, at uh, GPS, we're, we're really taking a, a, a kind of a full facility approach to it, depending on what the goal is, uh, whether it is a certification or a rating, or, or you're just trying to increase your diversion, uh, we try and um, incorporate elements uh, throughout the building, um, including uh, looking at uh, chemistry mechanization um, and diversions is what we're going to focus on primarily. But but just really looking at the, the way that the facility is maintained uh, can assist with uh, with decreasing the amount of waste that's generated in the first place. Um, and by taking this approach, we found that we've been able to help increase productivity within within the facility, but also reduce environmental impacts and, and do a better job of protecting uh, building occupant health. And, and so uh, we, we like to see where the nexus of of uh, the triple bottom line resides. Uh, I know that all of our eyes are um, uh, necessary for them to be on the bottom line, but uh, there is also a human health and an environmental uh, health impact on decisions that we're making uh, as we're managing our facilities, and it's good to be mindful of those. Um, uh, again, uh, there's by looking at the whole facility, you're, you're able to do a better job uh, but we're going to focus in on this recycling or diversion uh, um, uh, 
uh, aspect of things uh, to start. We have a number of tools that, that can be uh, made available uh, to help with um, uh, you know, coordinating a, a team, uh, doing a site survey, doing some training and, and identifying uh, items that, that can assist. And, uh, um, and then we've, we do have some tools here that, that, that help with um, uh, calculating green spend. So uh, we find that, that if, if you've got the right product used in the right process, procured on the right platform, uh, that helps to get, get you the best results. So let's talk about zero waste. Uh, I'm located here in San Diego, and um, uh, we have been uh, working with City of San Diego for many years, and, and one of the things that we're helping them with is a zero waste plan. That their goal is to, to uh, have the area get to zero waste by 2040. We've got a landfill that um, was originally de uh, designated as, as potentially running out of space by 2030. Uh, but by uh, partnering with uh, folks in the community, the city's been able to extend the, the lifespan out. Now they're seeing that it's going to be able to last further than, than 2040, and, and they have a goal of getting to zero waste by, by 2040. And um, they understand that, that, that uh, they're not going to be able to get to that goal without engaging everybody in the community. And, and, and so, um, they, they also understand that, that this goal is, is um, aligned with some state uh, legislation. And so for those of you who are attending from the, the state of California, you may be familiar with this Assembly Bill 341 that is requiring any uh, business or facility that's generating four or more cubic yards of waste, they must have some waste aversion uh, program set up. And then there's uh, also an additional assembly bill, Assembly Bill 1826, which is focused on organics, food scraps, et cetera. And this is something where um, it's uh, any business that's generating eight cubic yards of, of material must uh, have a way that that they are that they are um, diverting it, and it's and it's stepping down to um, in the coming years. It's going to be uh, something where you, if you're generating four cubic yards of waste per week, then you're going to need to, to, to be able to um, talk about what you're doing to uh, divert the, uh, the waste. And so um, this, is, this is all mandatory, and it's something that especially for, for the facilities that are in California that are tax supported, it's something that, that is um, uh, going to be of increasing interest and concern. We have um, discussions with uh, the public universities and also public schools uh, here uh, to talk about ways uh, that, that uh, they can be in compliance as, as we start to get into 2020. Um, as we have these conversations, these goals were set in, in 2011 and 2020 seemed like that was gonna be a long way off, but now here we are uh, and it's, and it's uh, it's almost 2020, so people are, are needed to work to uh, um, make sure that, that they can um, be taking care of these responsibilities. Um, one of the questions that, that gets asked frequently is, is what's a, you know, okay, I know that if I'm generating four cubic yards, I gotta, I gotta do something about it. What's a cubic yard? And so uh, uh, I've got a little illustration here to, to represent, you know, potentially what, what a three cubic yards would look like, but probably the easiest way to, to think about it is that if you've got a three cubic yard uh, dumpster or a four cubic yard dumpster, if you're filling that thing up each week, then that means that, that, that's, uh, that you have a responsibility for, for uh, um, uh, having some um, strategies in place to divert that waste so that you'd be in compliance with AB 341. And also if you're generating four cubic yards of organics, uh, per week, then you need to, to make sure that, that um, uh, you have a way to, to um, uh, divert that from the landfill. We have a, a whole article on our website that talks about um, uh, legislation across the country. 
And so I know that there's uh, legislation for, for folks that are in Oregon and Washington, um, obviously California, uh, even within California, there are certain municipalities that, that have their own uh, requirements. And so we link off to, um, to uh, articles that show all of that legislation uh, off of this off of this web page here. Uh, one of the things that that um, is of note, I believe, in as as we look at this topic of conversation, is that that traditionally recycling or waste diversion has been a voluntary uh, effort. People do it because they think um, it's, it's going to be the, the right thing to do for their business. Um, and what we find over over history, over time, if you look at 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 the topic. Um, uh, we as we as humans we we recycle. There, there's uh, there's evidence of recycling going back to um, um, you know um, prehistoric times where people are just doing what uh, like what we talked about at, at the end of of uh, World War II, where if resources aren't plentiful, you need to be mindful of those resources. And and I think that we are in an interesting bubble of history where where uh, we've had relative time of plenty. And and as a result, people, um, ha, you know, whole industries uh, uh, been sort of uh, built up that that's built on uh, uh, being disposable. And so I think that um, having these conversations is is helpful for us to to kind of reframe and 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 think about what can we do to be uh, better stewards of of our of the resources that are available to us, and what can we do to be better stewards of of uh, monetary resources that are available to us as well. So um, uh, one of the, the um, clients that we have a privilege of working with is um, University of California. And um, uh, I know that they have a, a zero waste goal uh, uh, that, they, that they're shooting for, for as, a, as a system. And each of their individual um, campuses also have their, their zero waste goals. And so we've uh, worked with uh, several campuses, and this this happens to be um, a breakdown of what what does waste look like on a college campus. So uh, doing uh, the proverbial dumpster dive, and you start sorting things out. And and one of the things that was found in this in this exercise is that when we look at what's being thrown out. Um, approximately 30% of it is actually trash, but there's a large percentage of, of the item materials that are being dis disposed of that can be diverted from the landfill, including um, uh, paper, um, uh, containers, uh, there's the food there at 16%, uh, organics, paper towel 11%, and uh, organics others uh, 9%. And you, and you can see how that breaks down. And so one of the things that uh, may be interesting is if you've, if you've uh, done analysis of your campus to see how it stacks up with, with this analysis and, um, and uh, uh, to see what, what are the similarities and differences. I would say that, that based on research that we've done and, and, and uh, uh, communicating with folks from Cal Recycle and, and communicating with folks from uh, the EPA, um, we see that there's some really big opportunities uh, for for diversion, um, including uh, you know uh, uh, food, uh, but also uh, uh, we're, we're talking to a bunch of people about uh, uh, diverting uh, paper towel waste, and and I'd like to uh, just take a moment to talk about paper towel waste and and and, and air dryers, and I know that that uh, that there's a uh, a, a potential uh, opportunity for for us to look at it in in that respect, and in full disclosure, uh, Waxy sells paper towels. Uh, we also sell hand dryers, and um, uh, we think there's potentially a place for for both of them. Uh, but but before uh, you know, focusing in on converting like an entire campus uh, away from paper towels, uh, you might be interested to know uh, uh, studied uh, or well. Uh, uh, some some work done by uh, the folks there at MythBusters on Discovery Channel. They actually um, uh, did uh, swabs of hands before and after um, washing them, 
and uh, and then they also uh, did swabs of hands before and after having them dried by paper towels or hand dryers. And so I think that there's some areas where hand dryers can make sense, but there's some areas where where the hand dryers um, uh, they found that that actually as people were were drying their hands that that um, if they dry them um, with a hand dryer that they, they actually end up with uh, some more bacterial residue on them than than with uh, drying with paper towels. Uh, the, the functional uh, explanation for that is that that uh, when you dry your hands with paper towels, that you have some additional friction that, that helps to get some of the, the, the bacteria off of there. And I think that um, uh, for, for the campuses that, that, that are choosing to stay with, with paper towels, that there's actually a big opportunity to, to look at uh, taking those paper towels and turning them into compost. Uh, uh, we see uh, this happening at a, at a large scale level in, the, in Northern California. Where, where towels are uh, uh, collected individually, and they are actually then mixed in with uh, food scraps. And, and it is something that, that when you look at um, turning food waste into compost, um, the food actually does need some carbon source uh, mixed in with the nitrogen-rich food to uh, make compost, and so, um, I think that that there's there's a great opportunity on on many college campuses to take these two waste streams and combine them so that that you are making compost. Um, and the one of the the contraptions that we've seen that ha that does a phenomenal job at this is is an in vessel aerobic food digester. And this this uh, uh, device was created on a college campus by a college professor and his premise was can i can i look at at creating compost can i can i create conditions so that composting happens as uh as fast and efficiently as possible so he developed this system and and basically what you can do is you could take any food waste including meat including dairy uh, things that that you can't put into a windrow, you can put any sort of organic food scrap uh, through this system. It uh, goes through a shredder, um, so it's almost as if you know it's uh, like a teeth uh, chewing food. Uh, uh, the the food then gets put into l uh, little uh, uh, pieces that are about the size of a sugar cube. They get augered up into the drum. And then uh, the drum rotates automatically every 15 minutes, and air is pumped up through the bottom. And it basically creates the perfect conditions for the carbon and the nitrogen to mix together, create natural uh, compost conditions. And at the end of five days, uh, the drum rotates and, and the material tumbles to the other side, and you have usable compost. Uh, that can be created at the end of five days. <clears throat> it's on a college. It's on a couple college campuses now, including Kane University in New Jersey, uh, Yale University, uh, I believe, has some. And then out here on the West Coast, we've worked with a food bank, San Diego Food Bank, and they have a, a device up and running. And it's it's really fascinating, interesting technology, um, and and it's a way of of thinking about okay, if if a college campus is generating a, um, uh, several tons of waste. <clears throat> what can be done so that that waste doesn't even necessarily need to leave the campus? <clears throat> excuse me, at all. What if you were able to take the food waste, run it through a contraption like this, mix it up with your paper towel waste, get rid of two, <clears throat> excuse me, two huge waste streams that are on your typical college campus. Um, so that's that's a, a big idea that, that I think is worth looking at. Um, I think that uh, when you when we're looking at um, uh, how to manage materials and, and move them around the the uh, the campus, um, it's important to think about the, the way that waste flows in a facility. 
and so um, I think uh, uh, we could talk about having uh, receptacles and signage. I think that, that that's very important. But also think about how are the how are the uh, how is the material being collected and moved to the back of the house, and how is how are the materials being stored once they're in the back of the house so that they can be taken away. Hey, and hey, uh, overall, you know, think about yes, sir. Yeah, I think this would be a great time to jump in a little bit as you're talking about uh, waste yeah. containers, the zero waste game, some partnerships and grants uh, that were, were accomplished, and we can share some of that information. So, Joe, why don't you jump in a little bit? I know we partnered with COLA and others. Absolutely. Hi. Good afternoon. This is Jill Burris, and I'm with the University of Arizona. And uh, as Chris mentioned, we just finished our Pac-12 zero waste game uh, in October. And we focused on our family weekend just so we could show current students, family, and potential students what we can accomplish with zero waste. And definitely, you know, as Keith said, the planning, the logistics, and understanding the flow was very important to the success. So what we did is we started early in planning. We engaged stakeholders both on campus and business partners and figured out, you know, what can we collect? how can we collect it, and how does material move throughout campus. From there, we worked obviously with Waxy, our, our hauler who is waste management, and then also Coca-Cola to ensure that for the game, for collections, and, and post-game, we had the correct equipment and logistics in place to move material. Uh, we collected both waste and recycling, and then we also worked with uh, concessions and catering to collect edible food to donate both to our campus pantry and then to uh, to partners in need throughout throughout uh, Tucson. Um, so yes, one of the largest things was definitely making sure to pair containers in high traffic areas. And then also we worked closely with our custodial staff to make sure that they were engaged and trained and we had a consistent uh, presence, whether it was custodial staff, uh, student workers, student volunteers, or or community volunteers for the event. They were trained with what was waste, what was recycling, where the material belonged, where it flows through the stadium, and then we created lanyards so students, volunteers, and custodial staff had a quick reference of what material we're collecting and where it can go. And so, Jill, you were heavily involved with working with the Students for Sustainability. Uh, how many total folks were involved, approximately? So we had over 75 people with custodial, we had about 50 students, workers, and volunteers for the game, and then we had an additional group that came in post-game for cleanup and source separation. Now, the one question everybody's asking uh, throughout their university is, what was the diversion? And our stadium <laughs> holds roughly about 55,000 people. It was family weekend, and so we had a nice uh, group. But uh, overall diversion that we had for that game? Absolutely, we had about 46% diversion, and we had 47 over 47,000 in attendance. So one thing that we were proud of is year over year we had more in attendance, and overall waste and recycling and material coming out was lower. In addition to that, as I mentioned, we we donated uh, nearly 300 meals to our campus pantry, and then you know a couple hundred meals to the to the gospel rescue mission as well that came from concessions. So, so Keith, we're getting questions that are coming in. Joe, thanks a lot. Uh, that's always uh, super helpful. I know as we look at trying to uh, get that zero waste, I know we also have a uh, Rutgers University and Rutgers is historically one of the number one uh, universities in the recycling effort. So feel free to ask some questions here. Uh, Keith, go ahead and continue on. There are some questions about the methane produced by the digester. And how do you ensure that methane is not released into the atmosphere? Sure. Yeah. So um, it's actually it's an aerobic um, digester. So so there is no methane that is produced. It, it's it's something that um, uh, because it's rotated every 15 minutes and air is pumped up from the bottom, it remains aerobic. It doesn't go anaerobic. And so the only byproduct that's produced really is uh, steam. Basically, the uh, any any sort of um, you know, as as uh, the natural compost uh, process is happening, it it heats. You know, it it go, gets up to uh, in temperature, and and so some of the the uh, liquid in the food actually comes off as steam. 
and so uh, um, we can go back uh, here. Uh, can't necessarily see it uh, super well, but but you the, there's a vent there towards the back uh, where you can see where where some that's that's basically the the byproduct that's produced. Um, and I know that that uh, when we talk to college campuses, I know that there's several of them that are that that are looking at anaerobic uh, systems and 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 trying to uh, capture some of the energy to 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 create power. Um, and this is something that is um, um, you know I've, uh, doing a different process. So that hopefully that that helps to answer uh, that question that part of the question. Um, so uh, as as you're, you're you're very welcome. So as as we uh, uh, move on and start talking about uh, and 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 thank you so much, Jill for and, and Chris for sharing uh, the the experience at the game and and I think that that that's a great tr also a great transition point to talk about how to engage custodial staff. And so one of the things that we've seen over time in working with custodians and janitors uh, since. Uh, you know, the mid 40s is the importance of training for for custodians and and uh, uh, every once in a while we'll have uh, some customers say, well, well, what if what if we train uh, all the staff and, and they leave and and uh, um, we, we like to say, well, what if what if you don't and they and they stay? <laughs> uh, uh, we find that 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 people who are trained and know what they're what's expected of them, they get greater job uh, satisfaction and they end up staying longer and and so um, we like to, to work with uh, custodial crews and and try and give them tools and education to help make their jobs as easy as possible they have a challenging job and uh, but but those are our people and, and so we've come up with a variety of different training to help with um, you know floor care and carpet care and restroom care and all the things that 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 uh, that you would think of for a facility maintenance supply uh, company, but but we've also come up with an online module geared towards custodians for zero waste. One of the things that we identified in in talking with several clients, including City of San Diego, is that that uh, sometimes what will happen is that there will be a zero waste or waste aversion goal that's established at an executive level, uh, but the but the news and 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 the and the support doesn't necessarily always make its way down to the custodian. So we. We, we wanted to, to um, create something that that was really geared towards the custodian on, on the role the important role that, that they uh, can play in in achieving uh, zero waste goals and and uh, as we break it down uh, we that, that that brings up a great point in as, terms as of the training uh, for our custodial yes. staff that's always critical because they play such a key role in our universities and investing in the proper training, especially with these zero waste games and our, our diversion efforts. Jill, you, you uh, were heavily involved in doing training with the custodial staff. Give us some uh, examples, please. A absolutely. So prior to the, the season, I, I worked with not only our custodial supervisors, but all of our custodians that worked all of our uh, athletic events and explained to them why it's so important that we recycle. The success that the university had has had from zero waste effort and then also explain the type of material and how we're collecting it and it really engage the entire custodial group and then we provided them additionally like i said with lanyards that explain what's recyclable what's not so they have a cheat sheet while they're working with people have questions or they're un unsure about um, a certain type of material and one thing that i found that has really been been exciting is uh, the ownership that our custodial staff has taken in this is during the post game cleanups is working to make sure that the waste and recycling are separated that we don't have contamination and then first thing Monday morning following the games even even after the zero waste is what were our numbers everyone wants to know how much did we divert and was the material clean so it's really been a success with working with the custodial staff and has also made it that it's a process that can be continual regardless of students coming or going and what they're focused on. And Jill, we got a great question here from uh, Gerald Coleman and it is about that contamination. And so how do you prevent that contamination from getting into the, the waste stream, uh, especially when you're also composting? I, I think the best way to keep the waste, the compost stream clean is to work, you know, further upstream in the 
product cycle to make sure that what you bring on campus is either recyclable or compostable. And then working with the staff to train what is recyclable, what is compostable, and how that material should be handled. Excellent. Thank you, Jill. Keith, go ahead and continue on. Yeah, thank you very much. And if, and if I could just add in on, on the contamination, uh, we've uh, found that, that another really important thing is, is the, um, the benefit of, of having clear signage and messaging so that people, you know, it's, it's clear what people need to do. Uh, we do find ourselves uh, with, as, as people, we're bombarded by a bunch of different types of messages. And so, so uh, uh, we've been advocating for a standardization of, of what uh, a compost sign uh, could and should look like and what a recycle sign could and should look like so that people uh, can be clear about what, what's going where. For the most people want people, for the most part, people want to do the right thing, um, and there, you are going to have certain people that just don't care. Uh, but um, and and that's that's potentially going to uh, uh, negatively impact the contamination amounts. But but we have found that that if if we can have clear signage that we dramatically reduce the amount of contamination uh, that goes into um, uh, each of the different. Uh, waste streams there. So uh, as uh, we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, we wanted to have like a really good definition of waste diversion uh, for the purpose of, of, of the discussion here today. But also we, we go through that with, uh, with custodial crews and, and, and talk about what do we mean by waste diversion? What do we mean by zero waste? And so you can see the, the definitions that, that, that we have here. And, and then uh, just to seed the conversation, We've we've got some uh, questions that 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 would be good things to ask, uh, and and we find that having somebody uh, like a Jill who can be spearheading, you know, coordinating efforts and 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 really, you know, kind of uh, assembling the team and directing traffic is really critical to success. Doing the waste audit, all the things that 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 that, that were discussed uh, uh, about the um, uh, the. the the football game there at, at University of Arizona, and and understanding what's generated, understanding you know what what can the hauler uh, do to help, and um, and then making sure that you got the right receptacles placed in the in the in the right areas for for traffic lines, and then and then uh, talking about promoting it and and getting the message out to to the the building occupants or or the the building visitors, and so we we really see this. Uh, uh, can be described in, in three steps: uh, collection, movement, and storage. And um, and so by taking a look at your outdoor public spaces and, and thinking of uh, places where you can design um, uh, collection points, and then moving into your indoor public spaces and and um, and so what might be work out great for an outdoor space maybe doesn't work out so great for an indoor space and or maybe you want it to be a bit more decorative so uh um so think about the indoor public space and then and then go into your cafeteria break rooms food courts uh you definitely want to uh think about how are we collecting food scraps in in this uh, uh type of environment or this part of the facility uh, then there's going to be common areas uh, and 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 really kind of pinpointing where things are going to be where people can uh, use them uh, and and some places that they even want to have a personal space uh, collection. Uh, other places they like the idea of of uh, the people getting up and going to a, a common area. But but uh, these are things that we think are important to think about as you're designing uh, your uh, waste. And material, uh, your, your material collection process, and then think about your maintenance and, and your building services. So the utility trucks, the janitor carts, and uh, uh, what kind of, what kind of, uh, um, uh, wh wh where you, where are the custodians then taking the materials? And do you have a dumpster that's that's designated for recyclables or designated for for food waste? Uh, uh, all too often, we've seen the, the instance where you've got great receptacles, you've got your janitor carts all set up, where everything's all separated, and then you get to the back of the house and there's one dumpster, and, and everything just goes in that one dumpster. <laughs> and so uh, 
uh, uh, thinking about, uh, again, the collection, the movement, and the storage of, of materials on the campus. Other things that we think that are important to think about are, are safety uh, and, and making sure that the custodians have the appropriate personal protective equipment, uh, make sure that, that, that uh, uh, they have a, a way to uh, wash, wash, make sure that their hands are clean, uh, make sure they've got the right liners and, and, and that it's not, it's not too thick of a liner, not too thin of a liner. Uh, it, do the liners need to be compostable? Um, uh, those, I think, are also important considerations. And if you are looking at compostable liners, very important to make sure that, that you consider liners that, that have a third-party certification for compostability. Some, some um, uh, compost facilities don't take liners uh because uh you know they've 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 uh they've been uh, burned before because people are putting compostable waste inside of a non-compostable liner so i think those things are important uh, other things to think about would be uh there there's uh, uh, new contraptions that, that you can uh add into receptacles where you can try and separate out the liquids before they become waste and so so uh that that i think helps to decrease the amount of weight in the waste and also decreases the the uh, opportunity for you to have the the leaking uh, out of the bottom of the containers and or out of the bags when you're changing them out and then i think there's an opportunity here also to think about uh, bioactive chemistry uh organic waste is 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 something that that uh is going to be collecting on all these receptacles and and instead of using a uh, more traditional butyl based uh cleaner there's you can use actual microbes to do this work for you using the Krebs cycle. Uh, one of my favorite presentations was at a uh, college in, in California, UCLA, and, and talking about the Krebs cycle to some students that, that were talking about uh, waste diversion, and, and, and their eyes lit up, and they said they never thought that they would use the Krebs cycle when thinking about cleaning. But uh, anyway, uh, this is some, some chemistry here for you. So as, as we... Uh, begin to uh, as we begin to wrap up here uh, uh, we uh, imagine there being a market transformation in terms of, of waste diversion and, and facility maintenance where where uh, the things that 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 um, that are happening at campuses like Rutgers and UC Berkeley UCLA University of Arizona that 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 would be um, uh, market leaders um, we see uh, that hopefully being something that 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 the things that we call market leaders today uh, becomes typical uh, uh, operating practice of tomorrow, and and then you still have your innovators that are that are going to continue to push the envelope, and and uh, uh, we see that 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 ultimately uh, the goal would be to 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 get into a circular um, uh, 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 economy situation whereby uh, uh, each of the products that that we have uh can can either have a a technical uh nutrient that could be uh reused or a or a organic nutrient that could be reused and and that we that that we're really thinking about the the way that we're producing things uh, as Jill stated um thinking about what's coming on campus on the front end helps to to make sure you're more successful in diverting uh stuff as it's as it's leaving the campus on the back end and and uh and taking this sort of uh cradle to grave uh mentality and, and think of it more as cradle to cradle so so uh i think that uh partnerships with between colleges universities and and industry uh can help to um hasten and 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 uh and propel this this um ongoing market transformation uh in conclusion uh want to say thank you very much uh, again for the opportunity to, to share these ideas we're, we're, we're very honored to be able to work with uh, many colleges and universities and and we look forward to, to working uh, uh continue to work with the college and universities take these ideas uh, make them better and 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 help to improve results um uh, we like to say that at waxy we don't just deliver a box uh, we know what's in it what it does how to use it and and by the way the box is um uh, uh, locally sourced, it's, it's uh, made with um, post-consumer recycled content and is itself uh, recyclable. So, so th thank you very much again for, for listening uh, this morning, and, and thanks again for the opportunity to, to share this uh, information. Well, Keith, we, we sure appreciate uh, you sharing information. We appreciate Waxy 
uh, taking the time to partner with our universities. Uh, we have about 10 minutes here, and we're going to take uh, continue to take questions. So feel free to go ahead and uh, send the questions to us, and we'll go ahead and review. Keith, in terms of the recycling market, uh, we're trying to, to divert waste on campus. The current recycling market is not the best, uh, so that creates some challenges. Yes. Any comments on that? Yes, yeah. So um, uh, uh, we we have uh, spent the last, uh, call it 30 years, developing a, a, a recycling market whereby we collect recyclables, we put them on a barge, and we ship them over to China. And uh, the Chinese, um, last year, they implemented uh, a policy they call their national sword policy, uh, whereby they, they um, are saying that they don't want to take our recyclables anymore because of the high level of contamination that, that, that's found there. So, that, so um, uh, what we find ourselves in, this, in, a, in a kind of an interesting predicament because I think that people have the message that 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 uh, recycling is is something that would be a desirable activity, but but uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes people in with the best of intentions they take something that is not recyclable or not compostable, and they they put it in the recycle bin or the compost bin, and if it's if it's uh, the, uh, a wrong material, it can serve to uh, contaminate all of the, the materials that were perfectly recyclable or, or compostable. And so uh, I think that uh, we do find uh, many, many uh, municipalities, many communities across the country find themselves at a crossroads. I know that, that here in San Diego uh, had some, some extensive conversations with them whereby uh, last year um, running their a diversion program actually cost them money, and th that obviously is not a sustainable uh, platform for moving forward. So, so um, from our perspective, we we think that recycling and waste diversion is is as important, if not more important than ever. But making sure that we can educate folks on what is recyclable and what is not um, is is also very important for us to focus in on what are the items that that continue to that that ha, ha, can be recycled and 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 have a value in the recycle stream is very important and um, uh, we are partnering with nonprofits like uh, Recycle Across America to try and um, continue to get the word out uh, for uh, uh, for what is recyclable, what's not, and, and and I think it all ties back in with this challenge of contamination, so that so that we can. It, um, continue to try and develop the, the uh, waste diversion resources here uh, in America since we cannot rely on the Chinese uh, to uh, take all our recyclables. Well, thank, thank you, Keith. And as you talk about contamination, uh, Tom Harkenrider has asked a question, and this will be posed to uh, Jill. And it asks, what, what do you do with contaminated recycling in clear bags, Jill? How do, how do we reduce that? So, uh, Again, it goes back to what we do here at the university is we engage and train our custodial staff. One of the great parts of being on a university campus, but also a challenge is every year, one fourth of your students are new and re-educating them. So we work closely with our custodial staff, first of all, by making sure our containers are paired and in, in a traffic flow where people can use them and then uh, empower them to understand what is waste, what is recycling, and if it is contaminated, leave it out so it doesn't ruin the rest of the stream. Uh, as Keith was saying as well, uh, one thing with contamination, it goes back to the one bad apple can ruin a bunch. When people put things that are, do not belong in recycling, it can ruin the whole load of recyclable material. So we try to empower our custodians to know what to accept and then how to handle it if it's not, if it's not clean recyclables. Now, I believe you're also doing an audit, <clears throat> excuse me, an audit on uh, the campus waste that's coming out, the, the campus recycling. Uh, can you discuss that? Because that also helps with uh, the contamination and reducing and driving that down. Absolutely. So it, it definitely helps, you know, number one, to understand what what is our stream made of and where are there opportunities with the, with the challenging market we have. So 
one success we've had is through our waste audits, which we do building specific and then as a campus on a whole quarterly, is we notice that there's a lot of hardbound books that have come through a recycling stream. And that is typically more challenging to recycle and it's not accepted single stream. So what we were able to do here is work with our our libraries and our departments and and people we've identified through audits that have a, have hardbound books and then find a, a partner that is able to accept them and recycle them. So we've been able to pull out nearly 70 tons of hardbound books that would have been either contamination or landfilled beforehand, and now they're able to be recycled on an annual basis. Se 70 tons of books, and what a great opportunity for colleges and universities as our, our libraries are really becoming more digitized, that you then can go ahead and make sure you partner with the key, key staff at the library, and then also make sure that we're recycling those books. Uh, Keith, we have a question that has come up regarding a cost, uh, if you have it, and it's regarding that digester. Uh, Chris Bailey has asked a great question yeah. about installing yeah. that. I uh, was very interested in that piece of yes. equipment. Uh, and so if you could kind of just discuss yeah. that a little further. Absolutely. So, so the, uh, that piece of equipment comes in a variety of sizes, and it's designed to, based off the, the amount of organic uh, that is being generated mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So, so uh, the smallest one can handle up to 500 um, uh, pounds of, of waste, and, and, and the biggest one can handle 8,000 uh, pounds of, of food scraps uh, a day. Uh, the range, it goes from, call it 180,000 up to uh, a little over 500,000. So it's something that um, is uh, definitely a, a capital investment. But one of the things that we found is that depending on what the rates are for for hauling the stuff away, um, we found we, we we did a local university here and and found that they were spending thirty five hundred dollars a month to take the food away, uh, and uh, they were they were able to look at a piece of equipment here for thirty two hundred a month, so that they would have been cash flow positive in the first month, uh, and and instead of sending all the stuff to landfill, they were they could make uh, usable compost that they could then use around their their uh, campus grounds and and help them to de decrease the amount of water that they needed to to use uh, for the uh, for the plants and uh, also you know help to make the plants healthier. Uh, but it's something that uh, uh, would be happy to work with any college campus to do an ROI uh, and ROE return on environment and and uh, um, see if that's something that could make sense for uh, your particular campus. Hey, th thank you, Keith. Uh, and one of the questions ca came in uh, just regarding the PowerPoint. It's standard. We'll have the PowerPoint uh, presented onto APA's webpage. Uh, usually, Billy does a great job of getting that out there in about 24 hours. Uh, Tom has also asked about uh, the total cost of ownership for these uh, composting machines. And, and Keith, I think you kind of covered that. Uh, and we'll be following up a little further. Uh, I do have a question for Jill because the university and best practices throughout, uh, best practices that we all have throughout our, our universities, uh, Jill, students play a key role. And can you, can you discuss that? Because that's why we are here to have the students have that experience. Absolutely. I think one of the best parts of being on a college campus is working with students and the student presence. And we've been very fortunate here to to engage closely with students between students for sustainability, the compost cats, screening the games, and just especially as facilities that is involved with all different aspects of this is bringing different students in. In fact, I have a group of seven students that work directly for me within facilities and they're considered a green team. And one thing that facilities has given them the opportunity to have is see a whole bunch of different aspects of the campus, you know, from waste reduction, energy usage, and and understand the ins and outs and the whole system of what makes this campus work. That green team has also participated in the tailgating on campus. And some universities just have huge, huge tailgating. Uh, go over a little bit about that, because that's a great mm -hmm. opportunity also. Absolutely. One, we have a new indoor facility here that is used prior to football games, and it's been a, a great area for pre-game engagement. Our, our green team, our compost cast, our 
greening the game, have all had the opportunity to table in that area and engage with fans and kids and the community prior to the game to let them know, you know, what the diverse sustainability focuses we have around campus and how we're working to improve this campus on a daily basis. Well, thank you, Jill. As we wrap up, uh, we can see that student success is very uh, helpful in terms of our zero waste efforts. Uh, Keith, do you have any final comments in this last minute? Uh, I would just like to say again, thank you very much. And, and uh, um, I, I really uh, laud the efforts that happen at, at the college level. I think that college campuses play such a critical role in um, demonstrating what the possible is and also um, helping to, to, to shape uh, young minds as they go out into the world to, to uh, take the lessons the, the, that they learn on your campuses and, and, and help to, to make the world uh, a better place for all of us. And that includes ways that we can figure out how we can be uh, more responsible stewards of, of the resources that, that we have available to us. Well, Keith, thank you again, and thanks, Waxy, for the support of APA uh, and our webinar series. Billy, we appreciate all your help in getting these coordinated. Uh, and Jill, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you not only for participating in the webinar, but doing a great job here at the University of Arizona with our recycling efforts and our efforts to drive down our waste, uh, increase our diversion, and drive that zero waste effort. So excellent job. Uh, thank you, everybody from APA. We'll be back on the on the webinar series very soon, as Billy said, a weekly basis. Uh, this has been very successful in giving back to our members a continuous learning opportunity. Take care, everybody. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.